All right. Welcome back to the core track, everybody. So uh, I have a couple announcements. One is um, we know there's a lot of uh, cross noise from the, uh, from the vendor area. You're going to have a lot better audio experience if you move over to, to this section as opposed to sitting in that section. So uh, because of these speakers, they provide some feedback so they can't just crank the volume up infinitely. Uh, so if, if you were here for the last talk and you had trouble hearing, uh, a lot of it is because of the sound coming in from over there. So come on over here and our uh, speakers will be, uh, be projecting for you. The other announcement is uh, the, the UT staff have asked me to uh, tell everybody that jumping the wall and going out onto the field is not okay. We've actually already had someone do that. Uh, they will call the campus police who will taser you in your reproduction regions and cart you off. So please, please don't do that. Uh, uh, don't don't want to have to bail anybody out of whatever the UT pokey is. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they have one. Uh, so all right, uh, so our next speaker is Brian Kelly uh, from DataWire, which is a startup that uh, works with microservices. And he's going to be talking to you about microservices. Ha <laughs> ha, incredible, uh, incredible synchronicity. Uh, he's from, uh, from Boston. He's got a touch of the Irish to him. Brian Kelly, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am deliberately going to shout as loud as possible into this. Is this better? All right, good. So we're going to talk about microservices. So a quick show of hands. Who here has deployed more than 1,000 different microservices? What about 100? What about 10? All right, so good. We're all in that mode of getting going with microservices. So about me, real quick, I've worked in distributed systems most of my career. Um, I used to work with Corba, DCOM, all those kind of 90s, 2000s uh, distributed technologies. And uh, I recently worked for a company that we had a very large enterprise monolith and we strangled it with microservices. And now I work for DataWire to actually produce technology that solves problems around microservices. We're based in Boston, San Francisco, and the reason you should listen to me is actually you're not going to be listening to my opinionated thinkings around microservices. Actually, DataWire has been talking to the master microservice practitioners for over a year, people like you know the Netflixes, the Ubers, the Yelps, et cetera, and we've learned from them a lot. Of, you know, we've learned a lot of stuff from them, and I'm going to present those uh, lessons that they learned the hard way today. So microservices and DevOps is really a perfect match. Um, they're both around increasing velocity. Microservices really come into uh, you know their own with development velocity. Developers are f you just go faster. They can um, you know they don't have to worry about breaking a seven million line of code monolith when they release a little upgrade. And for DevOps, it's all about release velocity. You can do one without the other, and maybe you already have, but when you're in a high growth or a high scale company, um, doing one without the other is you know, suboptimal in quotes. You probably should do them together. So a microservice is, I mean, the whole point of a microservice is that it's really, really simple on the inside, but it's what's outside that's hard. And I love this tweet from a gentleman in Europe called Matthias Vareyes. There are only two hard problems in distributed systems. One, exactly one's delivery. Two, guaranteed order of messages. One, exactly one's delivery. And the whole point of this is to illustrate in one really nice pithy tweet that with a microservices system, you've got simplicity within the microservice, but you've just created a very difficult problem for yourself in that you've created a way more distributed system for your application to, to deal with. And it's, it introduces a whole lot more uh, issues and, and things you have to be really careful about. All right, so I created these 10 questions. Uh, you know, it's a little clickbaity, but whatever, I got 100,000 views you know, <laughs> on the blog that it started with, so you know, clickbait works sometimes. Um, but the reason we asked them, it is, it's a real important thing here. There are latent concerns with microservices. 
everybody kind of gets the acute concerns, the early stage concerns, which are, you know, oh, you know, we're going to have to package this thing and use Spinnaker to deploy it or whatever. But it's the things that happen after it goes into production that you, you might not be aware of. So the big microservices masters, those companies that have done this, have already learned those latent lessons. And also, it's important to know, you don't have to have the world's greatest answers for each of these questions. But asking them and discussing them is what's important. And you, know, you want to balance between parameter optimization, YAGNI, all that. OK, so the questions fall into three categories. Organizational concerns, architectural concerns, and development concerns. So we'll start with organization. Number one, have you invested enough in developer infrastructure? Show of hands, how many people work on a developer infrastructure or developer experience team? I sort of one or two hands kind of went up. Well, all of those big companies that have successfully deployed very, very large number of microservices all have, as a common theme, they have a developer infrastructure team. They invest directly into development infrastructure. They focus on uh, education, you know, libraries for the developers to get up and running. They have things like, you know, on the first day, a developer comes in, magic scripts set up their laptop, and then they're deploying to production that day. That's because they have these teams. So the three things you get with those teams are loosely coupled services, uh, or the teams will produce these, the ability to have loop loosely coupled services. Obviously, a continuous delivery workflow, and that's very DevOps. And then the last part that's typically most ignored is resilience, application resilience. Second question, how will your new service be deployed and upgraded? Now, uh, this is the, how DataWire sees the whole microservice uh, cycle. And the life cycle uh, is it's constant. It's, it's not, you know, deploy once and then you're done. The whole point of microservices is you deploy and then hopefully you're redeploying with new functionality very quickly and you're, you're cycling on that, um, that model very quick. There's tons of tools, but really it splits into development and then DevOps. So you define your microservice and you code it up and then you build it, create some artifacts, bake an AMI or a Docker container or whatever, deploy it, monitor it, connect it to other things, and then you keep going. And you know, there's so many technologies out there. We've, we've sort of taken a quick stab at the technologies on the right, but that list is very long, and it keeps growing. And the reason we're doing this, the business reason, the reason why your, you know, your CEO or, or your, your head of products or whatever cares about this, and the reason they've let us go into this microservice world is to get from the commit to the customer. If you're not doing that fast, and if you're not cycling very quickly on that, you probably shouldn't be doing microservices because you're not getting the benefit. So keep in mind all the time, if you have microservices that take six weeks to go through QA, you're kind of doing it wrong, right? So to get there, you need a continuous delivery workflow. You need to have that workflow at least defined, preferably automated. Uh, and as your microservices grow in number, you, you absolutely have to uh, start automating things. It just, it just becomes untenable. And, and this is the thing that is the sort of big debate, where do you test? Well, we're going to talk about testing later, but you do need to have it running in production in order to fully test. We'll get into that more later. When you're upgrading, I, I kind of spin this as a, a positive, but it's actually, it can be a negative. Every upgrade is an opportunity to screw it up. You have an opportunity there to break the contract that you've created between your new service and any other dependent services. So what do you do? Well, you have to build things before deployment and things post deployment to help mitigate that. For example, you got to have contracts, right? It's as, as simple as that. There's just no way around it. All of the people who have uh, really solved this problem well have got contracts. The microservice guarantees things to people who use it. You've got to have, well, you don't have got to have, but it's really good if you have dark launching, where you can send real production traffic to a microservice and you know, not actually send the replies back out to the, to the real users, but you can watch the effects of that traffic. Then you can use response diffing. You can fan out uh, a request as it comes in, 
send it to a couple of different versions, like old and new, and then see, you know, hey, did the new service reply with the same, you know, is it at least the same JSON schema? <laughs> you know, does it comply? Uh, you know, is there ephemeral data that, you know, maybe there's timestamps? Okay, that's okay that if that one's different. But you got to have that view of what's old and what's new and compare the two to be really sure that you didn't just break stuff. Um, you probably heard of canary testing and blue-green deployment. These are at the later stages. Even if you satisfied yourself that, you know, dark launching is okay, uh, the response diffing worked, you still probably want to just progressively roll out that microservice. And that's what canary testing will do, send like 5% of traffic over to it. And then blue-green allows you to roll back. If you roll out 100% of traffic and the thing just craps out and dies, you're like, oh, well, good thing we still have the old one, so switch it back. So let's talk about monitoring and measurement. There are ways of monitoring your service's health. An okay way is something we've probably all done, which is uh, you, you have a load balancer or something that's pinging into the microservice going, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? How many people, I want an honest show of hands, I'll, I'll raise my hand too, don't worry. How many people have implemented that with one line of code in the health check function that says return 200 okay? Yeah. How many people think that's really worthwhile and does you a good, you know, good does, does a good thing? Yeah, it's not really that good, is it? Why is it not good? What does it tell you? It tells you the process is alive, has at least one file descriptor to, you know, uh, available to, to have a socket connection and, and whatever, and then replies. And tells you nothing about the database it's connected to. Tells you nothing about, you know, thread pool limits. It tells, tells you really not much. But at least it tells you it's, you know, the process is actually running. So th there is some use to it. Better is, you know, calling home from the service to something else. So the service is actually saying, hey, here's some, you know, metrics. Here's the amount of, you know, database transactions I've, I've processed. Here's stuff I have done. But that's still not as good as we'd like it to be. What do you think? Who is the best entity in the system to determine if the service is healthy or not? Who says it's a service? Who says it's something else? The best entity is the client. The best entity is the person who is experiencing the use of the API provided by that service. That's the only entity that matters in that equation. Because that is the only thing you're, I mean, you're providing the microservice for that client. So if you're not providing a sufficient experience for that client, then you're failing in that regard. So watching the client's experience is actually way more valuable. For diagnosis, it's important that you monitor the traffic, not just the services. And it's because with a microservice system, you start to build up a graph of services that are interdependent. When one of them fails, which one is the one that's you know, introducing the maximum latency? Is there a cascading failure? So the flow around the system is really important. Not just, you know, oh, is the service, uh, has it got enough, you know, RAM headroom and CPU and file descriptors and whatever. You know, that's nice, but doesn't really tell you about the application because the application is composed of lots of different pieces. All right, so let's talk about testing. So we're moving into the development section. Testing for a developer in a microservices world is beautiful when they're just dealing with one microservice. Because they run the little unit tests and they, they don't have to worry about multiple languages and they don't have to worry about the old eight million line monolith they used to deal with. It's fire up node and just run a few things. Hey, my microservice is perfect. I love my life now. What's harder is testing the whole system. You've decomposed what used to be something you could do in process in a monolith and created a graph of things that can die, can fail, and have to be orchestrated or choreographed in order to work. So how does a developer verify that their changes to their microservice doesn't screw up the rest of the system? And I want another honest show of hands, please. How many people like staging environments? How many people have done, all right, how many people have created a staging environment? All right, and it was a full replica of production, right? Yeah. Well, what does it mean to be a full replica of production? You have the same set of 
network devices, you have the same configuration AMIs, whatever. Uh, do you have the same traffic? No, of course not. If you have the same traffic as production, guess what? You just have a another real production system. So staging environments make you feel good, but really they 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 aren't bringing that much value. So microservice testing changes the model of testing for developers. In the in a monolithic world, testing is all about before deployments, and it kind of sort of ends there. Like some people do smoke tests with their monoliths after they deploy it, but generally they know that the you know, 40 gigabyte jar that they uploaded into WebSphere is going to run predictably the way it did in their, on their laptop. In microservices, it's completely different. You've got to test before launch and you've got to test after launch. So before launch, you have you know, mock services that can simulate the other endpoints that are in your system. Um, but without having to run those gazillion other microservices locally. You have sophisticated development workflows, uh, regression tests, et cetera. So then you get your microservice live. And then the next phase of testing starts, which is reducing the impact of failure if you got it wrong prior to deployment. That's where dark launching, canary testing, blue-green, et cetera, comes into play. The important thing here is testing spans pre- and post-deployment. It cannot end before deployment. All right, this will be really quick. How will it be secured? <laughs> Just do it with common sense. It's kind of like that fear ba fear mongering that certain politicians do. And yes, you know, I'm continuing the uh, the trend of the talks this morning about mentioning certain politicians. But um, with enough fear mongering, you'll have to do so much security that your velocity disappears. So try and convince the upper management that you should prioritize the sensible stuff first. Because what's most likely going to happen to you is if you have a really simple vulnerability like SQL injection or cross-site request forgery, whatever, that's going to be the attack vector that someone takes. They're going to take the easy road in. And if you've plugged up the, the top 10 OWASP vulnerabilities, then the next ones will be internal staff, you know, disgruntled employees, whatever. And then the next one will be social engineering attacks. But you're not going to have the matrix happen to you. You're not going to have some, you know, guy in sunglasses say, I'm in, and, you know, jumps into your system, reverse engineers everything, figures out all your schema, sends fake requests around, and, you know, is watching all the encrypted data on a screen and goes, oh, wow, this is really sophisticated. Uh, it's not going to happen because that's going to be the least likely. Well, I, could, I shouldn't say it's not going to happen. But if it happens, you got other problems to worry about. You got a guy who's in your system and is completely screwing you over. Your 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 little bit of integrity checking on your microservice API is probably not going to help you at that point. All right, let's talk about configuration. How will it be configured? Not all configuration is the same, and there are different approaches for uh, static runtime and behavioral configuration. Most people think of configuration as the first one. You know. Where do I, you know, spit my log output? Where do I, you know, what port do I listen on, et cetera? And then you got dynamic runtime configuration, which is more about how do I tune for performance? Thread pool sizes, JVMs, et cetera. Behavioral configuration is way more cool and extremely important in a microservice environment because that's how you roll out features progressively. If you want to use, you know, canary testing or, or feature flags or whatever, that's where behavioral configuration comes into play. So, really good advice that we learn from the people who do this all the time is to use immutable containers. Just disallow, forbid, prevent random ops people from jumping on and saying, oh, you know, I'm just going to increase a, a limit here, you know, let me just you limit the hell out of this system. Um, that's fine. If you need to increase limits or do things, create a new container, and then you have you know, a lot more governance and a lot more predictability about that change. For the dynamic side, you can probably do it with zero configuration. In other words, if you have an adaptive system that says, uh, we hit the high water mark on our thread pool, well, you know, do you, could you just maybe adapt a little higher? Right, why do you have to have force a human to go in and do that? You can probably, you know, do some work to make that actually automatic. And behavioral configuration is really reserved for the, the stuff around progressive rollouts, routing, et cetera. 
All right, question number seven. How will it be consumed by the rest of the system? This is something we learned from everybody who's done it at scale. You need a contract. Your new microservice brings value to the system. I want another show of hands. How many people have written an SLA for a service or a feature they provided? All right, we see some hands. Good. How many people enforce that SLA in code? I see one hand. That's really important. If you guarantee, let's say you have a payment processing system, or a payment processing service, I should say, and you say that service will respond within 50 milliseconds or less, that's an SLA. So what happens if somebody is calling you and that response time jumps to 500 milliseconds? You violated your SLA, which means you violated your contract. The person who's calling you has to assume that your service is sick. So there are plenty of other things, not just about latency, but there are plenty of other things around the API semantics that should be captured. Um, item potency, can the client cache requests, um, all those kind of things. There's a tremendous amount of stuff that can be captured that um, Actually, we have, a, we have our own language. It's, it's like an IDL on steroids that captures both structural stuff, which is like schema, and also these behavioral items. Um, and the reason why we do that is for things like this. So this is Slack. This is Slack's API. Um, everybody understands structural contracts, right? You look at the documentation, and it says, well, here's the JSON schema or the XML for this API. And that's what this thing on the left is. It's a structural contract. But then you read down a little bit, and there's paragraphs and paragraphs of text. And if you look at what's, what's, uh, what's uh, highlighted, if the states don't match, you should do this. May only be used once. Expires 10 minutes. That's a contract. But there's no JSON schema for that. It's something that's intended for the human developer to consume and deal with. But it's just as much an important part of a contract as the schema and the URI or whatever you know uh, part of the the rest um, system. So, let's talk about discovery. The simpler your discovery system, the less flexibility it offers. A lot of companies start with DNS as their focus for discovery, and that's okay to get started. However, DNS takes really very little into account in terms of availability. It, it assumes services are where they, where they are recorded as being. Um, so and it also makes the developer experience really difficult. People are mucking around with Etsy hosts on their machine. It's just not pleasant. So very quickly then, they, they Google, uh, you know, what, what do the big guns use for discovery? And they inevitably find things like Zookeeper. Now, Zookeeper is like a swing of the needle in the other direction entirely, which it's a very strongly consistent database. However, if you're going to tie all of your microservices to it and how you know, all your clients and servers will find each other, be aware that as a strongly consistent system, it does not handle network partitions at all. Has anybody been bitten by this? You talk to the minority in a partitioned Zookeeper system, and the minority just goes, I'm not even, you don't even get read access. It's just, no, go away. So in a strongly consistent system, you're trying to impose semantics on your discovery system that really aren't appropriate. A better approach um, is look at discovery as a conduit or a channel. The service is saying, hey, I, I'm service, you know, credit card service on port 9000 on this host. I can do work. I would like to tell the world in our, in our system here that I can do work. That is basically an availability broadcast. So don't look at it as you have to store that in a big big database, think of it as getting that information from A to B. Um, so we have our own discovery service in the cloud, and you know it's eventually consistent. And it's essentially a, a pub subsystem. All right. Oh. <laughs> There's a psychological difference with scaling uh, when you ask people about it. When you say to a developer, hey, I heard you built this really great new microservice. Uh, will it scale? What's the answer going to be? Of course, of course, I'm so proud of my service. I'm amazing, I've done this before. You don't get a very good answer if you ask how it will scale. If you instead say, how will it fail to scale? Then initially you get the, oh, uh, it won't, it won't. But I guess uh, 
Right, and then you start to get a more productive conversation about the actual limits, because every system has limits. And this, you know, the, uh, we're not going to get into scaling and, and all the recipes for that. It's, it's <laughs> way more than I can do in the few minutes left. Just an approach about asking this question is discussing with the service author about their choke point sequence. What they predict will be the sequence of things failing. So they build a microservice, it's written in Node, it sits over Cassandra, and it's got HA proxy in front. And you say, all right, so let's say traffic increases. It's working fine now, but traffic's going to increase. Well, Cassandra will sort of hit some limit first. All right, so what are we going to do there? We're going to increase resources available to Cassandra. What's next? Oh, well, Node will probably go next. All right, so what's the scaling strategy for Node? Well, we're going to you know, just deploy more of them because they're, they're really cheap, and you know, then it gets back to healthy. And having that scaling strategy for each of those little areas is important because it tells you about your headroom that you have available. As things scale, they will fail. So knowing how they will fail is important. All right, so the last question is about dependency failures. This is by far the most important, best for last. And if you don't deal with service dependency failures, you're going to have a bad time. Remember, microservice architectures are highly distributed system by their nature, and that means failures will occur. It's not a question of if, it is a question of when. They will occur, and they will occur frequently. On the terminology side, just um, in case anyone has a different idea, when I say upstream microservices, I mean things that depend on your service by calling requests into your service. So if red is the, the, the color of the service we're dealing with here, the things that call on it are uh, upstream, and the things that it calls are downstream. Downstream dependency failure, ha you, know, you have to deal and expect the things that you're calling on to die and die really weirdly. So you need timeouts. You need circuit breakers to prevent cascading failure. Uh, back pressure, if you've ever been to a TSA line, and the conveyor belt stops working, does everybody just keep piling their, their luggage onto the thing and getting higher and higher? No, there's back pressure. You just sort of wait, because the conveyor belt can't take any more. Uh, you can use default response values. You, know, uh, you could have things that say, look, I'm going to return a, an empty but valid JSON schema instead of a completely screwed up response. Uh, you might be able to cache a response from a prior call. You need to know about your retryability and also fallback to alternative endpoints. But most importantly, please don't test your microservices failure with control C. Control C is not how things will die in production. Things don't die. They're not that nice to us. They get sick. They get sick way more often than they die. And upstream dependencies, things that depend on your service, um, you have to understand what it means for the rest of the system when your service fails. So there's levels of criticality here. If you are providing a non-critical service that you know, is, is not really crucial to business transactions, like, say, logging that's done completely asynchronously, it might be OK for that to die. Uh, you'd lose some data in your logs, but not too bad. But a super, super critical system um, that requires, uh, that, that is, you know, needed for the business uh, really needs some careful coordination. All right, this will take two minutes. I'll just show you a little bit about resiliency using DataWire Connect. Okay, so I have a monolithic web app. Don't laugh at my HTML and CSS. Um, Imagine that it's a, it's a simple little e-commerce app. We can add things to the cart. Oh, well, it probably would help if I actually started the web server, wouldn't it? There we go. Um, so I can add things to the cart, and I can check them out, et cetera. What I'm going to do is create a new microservice called Product Ratings. And the Product Ratings microservice simply adds ratings. So I already had it wired up. What's important to notice, my monolith was already wired to look for the ratings microservice. But do you see any errors on the page here? No. It couldn't reach the microservice or any instance of it, but we resiliently handled the fact that it wasn't there. Now, we don't get product ratings because the service, the downstream service wasn't there, but that's OK. It's a degraded system, but it's a working system. So now if I start 
one instance of it in port 8001. If I refresh, ta-da, there's the rating. And that's fine. Now I start a few more. Different ports, of course. And now if I refresh, I love this one-handed demo uh, technique. Now if I refresh, I get you know round robin load balancing across the three microservices. Hey, give me the rating for this item, give me the rating for this item, et cetera. So now everything's happy, and this is what most people test for is the happy path. If I now kill, and I'm going to control C everything, every single microservice, leave the monolith running, now I'm, gonna I'm going to uh, refresh. What's going to happen to my ratings? Who says they're going to disappear? Ah, someone was listening. That's great. Yes, they stay there because I have built in cache tolerance using our, our middleware system to say, you know, ratings don't change that often. So probably okay that they, that, you know, you can display them at least for some period of time. So you can see here, all the services were down, but we still render the, the, uh, the, the values. Now, one last thing I'll show you. Let me get two of them back. And then I'll be done. I'm going to make one of them sick. So I've started two instances, and I'm going to make one microservice sick with control Z, not control Z, C. So I've suspended it, but it's maintaining all its you know, connections, et cetera. It's essentially alive. Now if I refresh, I actually trip my circuit breaker right here on service two. And circuit breakers, if you've ever worked with Hystrix or whatever, they're extremely good for preventing cascade fa cascading failures because when all of the threads in that process realize that the service is down, they stop beating their heads against the wall trying to go back to it every, every single time. A circuit breaker trips and it opens the circuit, preventing slow of traffic uh, until a, spe you know, a certain amount of time actually passes. And there's the time just passed, 30 seconds. We now retest the breaker. All right, so that's the demo. Let me just quickly go back to the wrap-up slide. Uh, if you want to try our stuff, it's free and open source. Go to uh, the DataWire GitHub page. The link is there. We all work in public Slack, so you can join our entertaining conversations. Um, we actually we hold these regular microservices summits. We have the domain microservices.com. I hope you'll be able to remember that domain. Um, and we have the, the videos from all the recent talks there. And we have great talks from Facebook, Netflix, Google, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like Rigby. Does anybody know what Rigby is? All right. If you watched Silicon Valley last week, you know what it is. Um, I know every organization is hiring, but we are too. All right. Thank you. Any questions? I'll take Any the lavalier around since you've got that. Zero questions. You talked about the. Uh, Hello, is it on? Yeah, just shout the question. He'll repeat it. Okay. So in your in your SLA description, you talked about uptime, reliability. Between uptime and reliability, why are those really two different things? Um, uptime is like the aggregate view. Uh, so the question is, what's the difference between uptime, reliability, uh, as in terms of an SLA? Uptime is like the application level um, view of it, in, mar in our terminology at least. Reliability is the sort of lower level view. You achieve uptime through the reliability of individual services. So your uptime, I mean, if you're looking at a status page from you know uh, a major SaaS vendor they'll usually have their uptime uh, and graphed over time, but they might not show you the individual services that were going up and down during that period to achieve it. So it's just important to sort of separate the two because you can get great uptime, but you might have really blipping services going up and down all the time anyway. Does that make sense? Any other questions? So, so one of the things you talked about was basically resilience of service-to-service -service communication. There's, and really what you need is getting data to the services, right? 
there's multiple ways to do that. One way is for a service to call another service. Another way is for a service to subscribe to the data from another service. For the companies that you talk to, how many are doing either of those? And and can you talk about the trade-offs? Absolutely. So I guess the question is, you know, the old RPC model versus a streaming, you know, pub sub model of interaction. The trend probably five years ago was, you know, people started tentatively with RESTful APIs in a very simple RPC mode, but they are all transitioning to using, you know, things like Tasca or MQP implementations to uh, stream asynchronously data from service to another. They have plenty of one-way streams. They have uh, two-way things. They have one request, multiple responses. It's 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 pretty much going the way you described. It's it's getting way more asynchronous and way more stream based. Yeah. Questions. One more over here. Okay. So the question is about breaking APIs and contracts. So it it all co comes down to that pre and post assurances. Uh, and testing. So before you roll out, before you even build your artifacts, if you have structural contracts that you can apply, like let's say you have a JSON schema and you say these fields absolutely must exist. Additional fields can appear, but your clients have to, to know that additional fields can appear. In the XML world, I used to add fields to XML and then someone would, was running a validation saying to check that things, extra things did not appear and that was really annoying. So first of all, no destructive changes. Second of all is um, if you use dark launching where you can take a, a single incoming request from the outside world or from some other service and split it or duplicate it, send it to the existing copy, the old or the, the you know, 1.0, then send it to 1.1 and then compare the two on the way out. And if they're you know, essentially the same, they're identical, you're, you probably have not broken anything. But it all comes down to contracts. If you don't have things written down somewhere, either in an encoded form, like an IDL language of some sort, you know, uh, gRPC, Thrift, data wire stuff, um, if you don't have that contract, it's too loosey-goosey and things just get really messy. But you can accommodate for that with an insane amount of post-deployment testing, you know, progressively rolling it out or rolling it out silently and watching, did you screw it up or not, post. But we find a balance between pre and post deployments, you know, and using contracts generally makes things work. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, one more question. So you, you talk about dark launching. You, you talk about dark launching. How do you practically do that with uh, production data? Is the concern about the privacy of data or just the... No, no, no. If you have something coming in, presumably you're going to be modifying data with that incoming request. So if you're sending it both... You know, Okay, so yes, if you're going to make, um, so a dark launch, it's really easy for computational services that don't get backed by a database. Yeah. Um, for other ones, then, you know, you can, you could theoretically have uh, a, a complete, you know, copy of the database, but it gets expensive. So it's not something you use all the time, but you're absolutely right. If you, if you split the request into two services and that is a, you know, update a, a account balance or add $10 to account, then, you know, you don't want to add $20, right? So it's basically on an application by application basis. Sure. All right. Well, thank Tess. Uh, thank you very much, Brian Kelly, everybody. <laughs> all right. We have a lovely speaker gift for you. Uh, all right. Well, so uh, really exciting stuff. Uh, who's, uh, who's familiar with Netflix's Hystrix? Okay, so like Netflix puts out a lot of open source. Hystrix is the thing that convinced me, oh, they know what the hell's going on, right? It, who's read Michael Nygaard's uh, book, Release It? All right, so you should. So, uh, you know the Gang of Four Design Patterns book? So release it is kind of a design patterns book for the sort of thing he's talking about here, right? Circuit breaker patterns, bulkhead patterns, like you are not making web services in an educated manner if you have not read that book. So that's my plug. Uh, so great stuff, appreciate it. All right, coming up next, let me grab my coming up next thing.
We'll have a 15 minute break. Uh, the other two tracks, of course, are in the Centennial Room. And I've gotten this question a couple times. So you take either of these stairs up and you wind your way around. There will be people directing you. Those, essentially those big shiny uh, windows that you can see out there, that, that's them. You end up going around kind of a quarter of the stadium and they're there. Um, so that's where the other two tracks are. Up next, after the 15 minute break at 1145, we'll be doing uh, continuously delivering microservices in Kubernetes using Jenkins in the container track in the Centennial Room. Uh, DevOps meets APIs, model once benefit, uh, benefit everywhere uh, right here in the cool play. Uh, and the ops must be crazy. Hack your team's ops culture with one weird trick. Uh, also in the uh, Centennial Room. Uh, and after that, at uh, 1220, we'll be having lunch down there in our sponsor room, the Black's Barbecue, sponsored by Alien Vault, who I even work for. So uh, double, double thumbs up. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you to Brian, and have a have a lovely break. We'll see you back here uh, or in another zone of your choosing at 11:45.